Second. Okay. Uh, motion by Ms. Boyd, second by Ms. Counts to adopt the agenda as recommended by the superintendent. Is there any discussion? Seeing that all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes five zero. Are there any citizen comments? Yeah. Ms. Adele, do you have any? No. Okay. No, Chairman Dodd, there are no citizen comments. Would anyone like to approach the board and make a comment? All right. Seeing that, we'll move into number three. Item number three, um, we have a presentation of the overview of the proposed facilities and construction five year work plan. Good morning. I've uh, asked Mr. Stokes to come before the board today to update you on the five-year work plan, just so um, the board as a whole can be informed as to the uh, projects that we're uh, currently undertaking, the projects that we have in the, in the out years. Uh, so as you're out speaking uh, with the community, you'll know the things that lie ahead on the horizon in terms of facilities, okay? Yes. Mr. Stokes? Sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Classes on them. See, every five years we have to update our plant survey for the district, and we're approaching that window of time. It opens up the end of this year, and we'll start the update next year. Uh, with that being said, we also have to tell DOE the projects we're looking at, what we're working towards. So, we took this time to put together a quick PowerPoint, just a brief overview of where we're working towards. Um, the highlights of what we're working on, as you'll see, are going to be heavy maintenance type projects, major mechanicals, roofing with some construction in there on it. So I'm going to start running. The current year is already out. We'll start construction basically next week for this summer. So what we're talking is 19 on for the five year and then we also do projections for six to ten but that's not a part of this uh, presentation. For the current year of 19 we'll be coming back to you probably July, August for approval of consultant contracts. We're looking at working on Floral City Elementary School intercoms, Floral City Elementary School Building 2 HVAC, and Lacanto Primary School Fire Alarm, and roofing at Lacanto Middle School. As you can see, once again, mostly major maintenance type projects. That's gonna be the focus of where we're at right now. Following into the next summer of 20 is what you're looking at here. We're going to have to start addressing some of our structural components at Citrus High School, buildings four and six. That's uh, repointing if uh, some board members, I'm sure, remember when we did uh, Crystal River Middle School, we had to repoint the entire facility. And what that does is it seals the exterior envelope of the building, water intrusion, things like that. Floral City Elementary, the kitchen renovation remodel, that'll be on the summer of 20 is what we have it slated for right now. That'll be a pretty intense project because we've got a lot of work to do in that one. Intercoms again, we're having a lot of issues with intercoms as they fail. We, we put them on a priority list to replace them. So that'll be out at Canto High School, HVAC upgrades, middle school, and then with Canto Primary School re-roofing will be a major one there. The summer of 21, we'll be looking at following projects, Citrus Springs Elementary Intercom, once again, you'll see, and you're starting to see the pattern here of how we're working towards. The elementary school, the kitchen remodel renovation, we have that one slated for 21 summer. Forest Ridge, the fire alarm systems out there, and understand these fire alarm systems as we've had conversations in the past, the reason you see us constantly updating them, we literally are buying Inverness Primary School, we were buying parts before we replaced it on eBay to keep it used parts because they become obsolete. It's technology, it's electronics. They have a life cycle. We've pushed well past that window of the life cycle in the district, but at some point we do have to address them. You just answered my question. <laughs> okay, that's, that's, I figured that was going to come. Same thing with the HVAC systems you'll see with Canto. It's the same thing with the electrical. Unfortunately, with all the technology demands, it's really taxing our electrical systems in the district. And we've done throughout the years, as some of you remember, we did with Canto High School one upgrade on the northern half of the campus about five years ago, six years ago, so we're going to do the second half of the campus. So, yet, yes, ma'am. This is just not something like that to upgrade it to. Uh, it's a safety issue because it's yes, an announcement made and you can't hear it and you don't know what's happening. That's a safety issue. Yeah, and that's like the intercom systems going back to next summer, 19, the first slide you saw. You saw Floral City. 
out there, that intercom system is antiquated. It doesn't come to the campus. We're aware of that. The staff does well with what they have for radios out there, but it's definitely something we want to address and get on the books from that safety perspective. We want those all-call announcements to go out. Yes, ma'am. So also we've got to get into with Lacucci Technical College over the roofing on that one in the summer of 21. We've got a lot of work to do on roofing over there. We will start that. That will be a phased project, needless to say, because of the cost of roofing, as you all have seen. It's, that's not a cheap one. Reaching towards the further end of the five year, the 22 year, we'll be looking at Coral City Elementary School, the building re-roofing out there. We did portions of that roof about nine years ago. This will complete the campus and take care of the rest of it, so that campus will be solid for a while roofing-wise. Inverness Middle School, we've got a lot of roofing work to do out there. There's that fire alarm upgrade again at Lacanto, and this is all, we're life cycling these projects out. We maintain a log of them, the age of them, when they're installed. We maintain service records, what our costs to maintain, things like that are. Freezer cooler, that'll be Mr. Pistoni, identifies a lot of those type of projects for us as they start failing. We try to get them into the plan, understanding we can't do everything next year. So that's why we create this plan to work through. We can't tell high school, their intercom, that's original, same thing as we talked about. And then the primary school HVAC upgrade, that, that, <coughs> one's, that one's well past life cycle already, so we'll address that one in 22, hopefully. And then the final year, fifth out year on it, we'll be looking at Citrus Springs Elementary School fire alarm. Uh, the Crystal River High School freezer cooler we've got in there. Lacanto Middle School HVAC, Lacanto Primary School HVAC. Once again, Lacanto Primary Intercom and then more roofing at WTC. So you kind of see the pattern for the next five years being large, heavy maintenance type projects to maintain our facilities. Any questions? Yes, I've got a question in reference to Floral City Elementary School. Yes, sir. Um, you know, there's still, we had moved on some design features for that school and that was um, uh, prior to our attempt to have a half cent sales tax pass for capital. Um, obviously there's still portables there at that school since the mid-1990s. And so I know we went into uh, some, des some um, design options. And uh, I just wanted to get a little update. I, I mean, I, it's not right here in the five-year plan. We've got an um, upgrade, it looks like, to the kitchen renovation. Um, but I want to know how this ties in because we need to get something planned um, for that school um, and we also I know they have looked at in, in uh, increasing the student stations there so I want to know if we need to get something in the five-year plan or where we are with that project well as you summarized there we put together a master plan scenario with three phases on it budgeting associated with each phase phase one um, and I'm going from memory here so don't hold me to the letter of the law, but the overview of it, phase one was the replacement of the portables. At this point right now, it's a funding option is what, I mean, the projects we have listed here are major improvements as far as maintenance. A project like that, I'm sure we could entertain it, but that would be the board's will if we went back down that path with it based that's, on the funding. That's where we're at right now. We're trying to go through some call saving measures, and Mr. Stokes will speak about that, within the current capital fund that we currently have. As you can see, these items that uh, Mr. Stokes shared with you, we talked about replacing the roof, we're well beyond a million dollars to replace the roof. Right. HVAC systems, those are all very high ticket items. And with dwindling capital funds, the only way we're going to be able to pay for any type of change to Full State Elementary to address those portables is one of two ways, either save some of the money we currently are receiving or come up with an alternative funding source. Right now, we don't have that alternative funding source because the uh, half cent sales tax initiative failed, as we know. So we're trying to take some cost saving measures, make some cost saving measures within the uh, uh, maintenance department and facilities department to save the capital funds. But the reality is we have a new mandate that's put in place upon us to harden our schools for the safety, and we don't have any defined criteria as what it means to harden a school in terms of shooter safety. We're, wait we're awaiting that right now. We don't know where that goes. We know there's some funding options available with that yes. through writing grants. But this is it's too early to tell because we have not been given uh, information from the state as to A, what, what qualifies a building to be hardened, what do you need to do to harden the build, building, and we haven't been able to secure the funding yet. So right now, the monies that we are saving through these measures that Mr. Stokes and his staff are, are putting into place, we're trying to hold on to those monies to try to address some of those undetermined or undefined needs at this time. Does that make any sense? But certainly for all city, we've heard the, we've heard the direction of the board over the last year, year and a half or so, to hey, let's be mindful of all city. 
we're very mindful of it, but we have got to find a funding source at this point in time. The only other option we have to do, the only other option we have at our disposal is to prolong these projects that Mr. Stokes has identified, saying, you know what, maybe we don't replace the HVAC system, we don't replace the roof, but there's some inherent, there's some inherent problems with doing that because I can tell you we have been very prudent in our preventative maintenance and we have been able to extend the life cycle of our HVAC systems as well as our roofs well, well beyond the, the life cycle, what, what they're expected. I mean, we're getting, in some cases, 27 to 30 years out of a roof when in reality it's supposed to be 20 years. Correct. So right now, Floral City, it's a, it's a funding issue, but we're trying to do things internally to try to save some money before we can address that, that issue out there. But yet we have a kitchen renovation in here. So That's my correct. question is, exactly. why, are we gonna, why do we want to keep that on the plan then if the goal is the bigger picture? I mean, why, why do we want to put all that money in a kitchen renovation when in reality those plans that we looked at had all that already included in it? And you know, so what my question, I guess, is why can't we move ahead with a plan to renovate the kitchen and, and build a, another building for the, where those portables are and put that on the five-year plan. I mean, because obviously we don't want to, we don't want to, you know, spend money for a renovation that now is going to be changed. Like, you know. You're exactly right. We and Mr. Pastoni, <coughs> when he has proposed us for us to renovate that kitchen in two years from now, we have told him that we're not going to do anything that would be in, in conflict with any type of remodel of the cafeteria. When you hear kitchen, we're not talking cafeteria. We're right. just talking the cooking area, the freezer, cooler. Got you. So he knows that it's got to it's got to be uh, in it, it's got to be in concert with future opportunity out there. But certainly, if it's the will of the board to to put in the three in three years out uh, the remodel in the full city elementary, we can certainly put that in the plan. But I, I, I'm just going to say that I'll have to come back before the board and, and solicit you guys for all funding because I don't know that we're going to be there in two years with what we can control internally with the limited funds we have. I don't know that we can we can control that. To, to, and, to, be able to save enough money to cover that cost. And, and while I, I completely agree with you, Mr. Gods, on this, and we've talked about this in our board meetings, uh, but I also agree that with you that we want to make sure that that renovation is part of the master planning that we've you know laid out. Correct. Um, that's probably my only concern about the portable replacement is that that would need to be, I would feel like, something that's part of that master planning, consistent so that we're not going to undo something later down the road. And I think I think everybody's in concert with that. Absolutely. The, yes. But I do think it's a good time to say, because it is on the two-year, and it keeps creeping up. I, I mean, reality is, I know they kind of need it already. Yeah. The problem I'm still having with the whole cafeteria kitchen is, how is it going to be in concert to that master plan? Is that the facility that we should be spending money in, or should we be looking at is there something we should be doing to say, okay, can we will we save more money down the road if we do X then? And I think that's, that's really what you're saying as well. And I think it's not today, but as we start as you start pulling that off the shelf and start doing that, that's really what I think we've got to be cognizant. How will that fit into continuing forward with that master plan? Not saying okay well we didn't get to do that so now we're just patching something up together temporarily i don't think we want to patch something up. and that's not our intention I mean, let's just talk about next year the contracts you'll be seeing in july august depending on when we come to an agreement with consultants on it that's uh, we have floral city the hvac system and the intercom system when we do the design of that system we will do it for a larger facility it's it's yeah. pennies on the head end equipment now when we do a project years from now whenever that may be funding available we will have to run the pipe wire and things like that we will put in the infrastructure <coughs> equipment to accommodate that new portable and areas like that in concert with that master plan phase one two and three that we put together a year and a half ago two years ago on it so those next year's jobs we've already got that in the in the works to expand it's the kitchen cafeteria one we'll have to have a conversation at that point we get a little closer on it. and this will come back before us because yes sir year, absolutely I mean next year's plan you're going to be doing the same thing we're going to have yes I'm sir. sure we're going to even be more in tune to saying okay what well, where is that going to fit into yes sir and certainly anything we do at that on that facility we need to do it with the mindset that whatever we do today dovetails into that expansion that we have in that master plan. I know that Mr. Dixon already kind of has been warning us that our elementary numbers um, just continue to increase, which is wonderful, but that's also at the very area that we can keep shifting and twift, you know, tweaking, but there's not a whole lot of place. 
Pomona Sass's numbers are, are all the way up. Pretty much all of where we had space, including Pleasant Grove's numbers are starting popping back up and we did all that to try and you know alleviate Pleasant Grove. So we also have the secondary issue of we're gonna need space for some of these kids. Um, and we haven't even addressed what we all know is IPS, which is really a to me a big storm that's sitting out there that we're gonna have to address. But we are protecting we the integrity of that city. building. We did the fire alarm systems last year. This year, Absolutely. this summer, we're putting the roof on it, completing the roofing system. So at least that, that's our focus right now until we understand, like Mr. Bishop said, somewhere in mid-July, we're expecting to see something from DOE on hardening and requirements, things like that. Uh, that's what I'm hearing anyway from DOE. We should start getting some feedback on that. But until that point, we continue to protect our structures for what they are right now. Well, you know, one of the things that we should look at too then is we deal with school safety, uh, having those portables, which is a, a completely different wall structure than a, than a concrete block structure that other students are in. Okay. And I know there aren't classrooms in all those portables, um, but there are students that are in those portables every day. I mean, that's a safety factor. You know, that is right next to the parking lot. Um, and I just, I, I gotta tell you, maybe we should look at using, if we have capital monies to look at, at school safety issues, that would be one of those that we could, we could tie in to that facility. It, I guess to me it just, you know, I've been on the board four years and we still don't even have this project on our five year plan. Now, I know we pushed that we, we did some planning and we tried to get some funding for We do carry it as an active project still. So we didn't fully right. close it. Just so you it's just not on the five-year plan. Yes, sir. So I know, you know, we, we, we tried to push for that for Floral City and for Emerus Middle School and Emerus Primary School and those changes and we, we didn't, we weren't able to, we, you know, to convince people that there was a, a need for funding so we lost the absent sales tax. But still, the, the long-range plan, to me, is we've got to improve that facility and those buildings at Floral City. And, um, you know, I just, I wish that we could get it on the five-year plan, but obviously that requires the funding <laughs> That's source. That's what I was going to say, If the board will, will, will provide us a funding source, we'll put, we'll put in the Floral City, we'll have this little. But at the end of the day, we build a plan based on the funding that we currently anticipate to receive. And we try to work within that within that realm. But if there is an opportunity for additional funding, we'd be more than glad to put that on uh, on our plan, and we'll we'll be ready to initiate and implement that plan. I believe we, have we can't to, put it on unless we can, we have a funding source in the first two or three years. And that's correct. This is the and we'll do that plan survey. We'll resubmit it to DOE in April of next year, and we can put projects on there. But we definitely have should have funding identified for them. And this plan survey also they tell us the direction. Uh, we we established a project priority list, which tells us which types of funds we can use. You'll see all that come across from time to time. On it. And that's so we all put it on the five year without funding. But Can as it starts, it. keeps creeping right. back towards us, we, the idea is we have to have a funding source by, as we get into that two or three. And what we know with, with projects like schools or, or major renovations, the funding sourcing, I mean, the planning takes one, two, sometimes right. three years <coughs> of that architectural review and all of those DOE requirements. Get yes, DOE requirements. So we put it on the five-year plan. For a project like that, we're doing it. Point of, is that pretty much correct? That's, yes, that would that would be a good. I mean, we are we have to be ready to actually Absolutely. move forward, and that's why we carry it as an active. We haven't closed it. If we do, and once we get the hardening requirements, things like that, possibly that'd be a good time to review this again at that point. Yeah. Well, certainly, we can bring we can bring this forward to you uh, more more frequently than once a year, if you like. We can bring it back. We can bring it back uh, twice a year, uh, just to update you prior to projects be, uh, be, be, uh, being started. And after they're completed, if you like, uh, whatever the will of the board is, but certainly we recognize there is an issue out there. We want to we want to make sure we're uh, addressing that. But right now we're struggling to manage well, the money. I mean, I like what I hear about the kitchen. I mean, it's not going to be done in a way that's going to have some end done later. No, and uh, the other thing is, I think that when we get the recommendations from DOE on on hardening, I mean, that we should look at that facility. Okay. Yeah, we don't know what they're going to be. I've heard that yeah. July 1st they'll have the OEF will have that department established. So from what I'm hearing from DOE side is they're expecting to start seeing some recommendations mid-July, possibly as late as August. To, and that'll start giving us an idea of what we're looking at. Okay. Well,
Just and um, whether it's you know Ms. Wilson or, or Mr. Bishop, if you can tell us um, and how much money did we get from PICO dollars to be able to plan for new schools? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, that looked like a really zero. big zero. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stokes. Yeah, well, yes, sir. Point of clarification. Just going to keep that out there. About 47 cents it didn't actually eat. Okay, our next item is um, item number four uh, school support services, um, instructional and support recommendations. Ms. Swain. Good morning. I ask the board's approval of the instructional and support recommendations as listed on the goldenrod. Did they accept the personnel recommendations uh, on the building rod, May 27th? Okay. We have a motion by Ms. Count, second by Mr. Bryant, to approve the instructional and support recommendations as listed on the building rod. Best wishes to Ms. Wyndham. Yeah. We're going to miss her. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Okay, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes five to zero. Thank you. What's our numbers? Current our, openings? Yeah. 53 teachers and 20 support are current. So they're coming down. We are doing a lot that's of hiring. Actually, so you should see quite a few in, in June on the list. Thank you. Just another note, it's Monday, July 30th at Citrus High School, new teacher orientation. If you'll add that to your calendar. Thank you. Monday, July 30th. I think I have that on my calendar already. I think we just got an email from Ms. Lindy today, too, uh, about the welcome back. Uh, that, that's the welcome back on August 3rd. Yes. August 3rd is the welcome back. Any previous keynote speaker yet? No. <laughs> oh, no. It's going to be big. It's going to be big. <laughs> <laughs> All right, our next item is uh, risk management, Ms. Cernich. I'm going to ask Mr. Bishop to come forward. Um, yesterday he met with Sheila Pendergast. Um, Mr. Bishop will summarize a little bit of that conversation. And then Sheila Pendergast <coughs> is, um, is here today to answer any questions that our four members may have. Yes, good morning once again. Um, as we all know, Senate Bill 726 has put some requirements on uh, local agencies to provide security in our schools. We know that uh, pursuant to that piece of legislation, the, the um, options are somewhat limited and, and clearly defined. We've gone through this conversation um, over the last couple of months, but the most recent conversation I had was with uh, Sheriff Pendergast and uh, Ms. Seffrin yesterday. I wanted to update you as to that conversation share with you where we're at with that and then I did invite the sheriff to attend today to answer any questions you may have. But essentially I think we need to begin by saying what we said from the very beginning it is our our desire has always been our desire to uh, maintain the relationship with the Sister County Sheriff's Office and make by uh, having them provide the security on our campuses okay but as everything seems to come down to today you know funding has been a um, has been a topic of, of, of discussion. The most recent discussion we had yesterday, just kind of cutting, cutting to the point. Um, I believe, and certainly, Sheriff, you can correct me if I'm wrong when you come up. Um, my understanding is that in order for us to get next school year covered, it's going to be 1.1 million dollars. As you guys know, the um, adjusted safe school allocation from the state was 954,571 dollars. That was provided to us as a district. We also know that um, as a result of that piece of legislation that we have to have a sa uh, school safety specialist position. We're having to go through that process um, to put someone in that role. Additionally, out of our safe schools monies, we've also, um, in years past, we've paid for crossing guards and nighttime security. So the board is faced with some uh, expenses in terms of safety but I believe if you recall that the uh, board sent a letter saying that you guys had pledged, had previously pledged, you agreed at our last meeting to pledge the entire $954,571 uh, to help offset the cost of the uh, security provided by the SRO program. Having said that, at $954,000, you guys have 
I've already committed to essentially delving into other fund sources for the $200,000 to cover the expenses that you're faced with. So the sheriff and I had a conversation yesterday um, that is in order for them to provide the service, it would be $1.1 million. Um, I, I believe it's my understanding that in order to get down to $1.1 million, the sheriff would have to lease vehicles. Um, and talking with the sheriff, it was my understanding that there was a desire for there to be a multi-year agreement because simply because of the leasing of the, of the vehicle. But certainly, I would defer to the sheriff for that uh, to come up and, and explain that to you guys. But right now, it's a $1.1 million. Um, after the sheriff speaks, I do have Mr. Cerny uh, prepared to come up and share the only alternative we're faced with. Because in speaking with the sheriff, he was, he was very clear that the guardian program is not going to be an option. In order for us to use guardians here in Central County, we would have to have the uh, approval of the sheriff, and uh, that's not an option. So then we have two other options. We either go with the SRO program or we start our own police force. Uh, but I think in order for you guys to have the most informed conversation, I believe it would be prudent for me to uh, give the podium to the sheriff so he can be prepared to answer any questions you have, and then have Ms. Cerner share with you the option of a police force. And certainly, um, from a staff perspective, we just would like to have direction as to the way we uh, we need to proceed from this day forward. Okay? Thank you. Sheriff Pendergast? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On the 10th of April, when we met with the Board of County Commissioners, the Superintendent, all of you uh, members of the school board, and myself, uh, we discussed a variety of factors. We walked away from that meeting agreeing that we need to add nine additional school resource deputies to our program that is not only nationally recognized, but is a leader in the United States of America. Over the preceding weeks, uh, we have talked about a lot of ways to try and solve the problem of funding. We know that there's a funding shortfall. On the 27th of April, I met with Mr. Dodd and walked him through a concept that would save a couple hundred thousand dollars in startup costs. And what I specifically talked about during that meeting was that if we could work out an arrangement where we continue our partnership that's been around for decades through the next five years, we could go out and lease vehicles and defer the startup costs of over $200,000, which would reduce the original delta of over $400,000 uh, on top of the $96,000 that was pledged in a previous school board meeting to a very small number of $87,406. Now right now, sitting in the impact fee account for law enforcement, there's $176,000. The county commissioners have voted to not reallocate that money towards uh, the school resource officer program. But as we close the gap to keep the model of protecting the students the way it has been for more than two decades, I believe if we could come to an agreement today, we can go back with a very compelling argument to the Board of County Commissioners and convince them that with a lease program, a five-year agreement, cutting the startup costs, and then leaving a mere $310,000, which would be split 50-50 between the school board and the Board of County Commissioners going forward, that we could end up with what right looks like for the entire state of Florida and indeed the nation, especially in light of the tragic shootings that occurred in Texas and in Georgia on Friday. And ladies and gentlemen, we have worked these numbers and worked these numbers, and I've subsequently met with uh, Mr. Dodd again on the 3rd of May to talk about these numbers, and we've talked about this is a great bridging opportunity for the 18-19 school year while the governor, the cabinet, the legislature, and those of us that are out here in the field implement SB 7026. It's not perfect, but again, <clears throat> We're taking a model that has worked for a very long time in a much more critically, I, I think, uh, environment, a much more dangerous environment than what we've seen in the past. We've had nearly one school shooting per week in the United States of America this year. And the investment that we put forth here today 
continues to ensure that we've got safe schools, that our students are not only protected, but our staff and faculty are protected. And I dare say that all of you sitting up here um, on the dais this morning probably saw some of the reporting that was very raw footage on Friday as the events unfolded and as we de dealt with the deaths of 10 more folks who died on a school campus on Friday. And as we look back at that, there was a lot of discussion about fear among parents, among students, and among the professional educators. So what I want to encourage you to do is consider the success of this program and its long-standing achievements that have been brought about by some of you sitting right up here today that have went all the way up to Washington, D.C. to be recognized as the right way to do things when it comes to protecting our campuses. And indeed, when you consider that we have $98 million coming out of Tallahassee to help us with the school hardening, it's a great compliment to have the school resource officers there. In the shootings that have occurred that we've had a law enforcement officer on campus since the uh, unfortunate circumstances of the Parkland shooting, a trained law enforcement officer has engaged the shooter and saved lives. We saw that in Maryland, I believe, on the 13th of March, and we saw it again on Friday in Santa Fe. So what does that amount to that we're asking for? Well. When you look at the fact that we have 145,647 citizens in our county today, and we need $301,379, that amounts to $2.07 per person in this community to actually protect our students, our staff, and our faculty on all 22 of our public school campuses. Ladies and gentlemen, $2.07. That's a precision investment in a model that protects our students going forward for the next year and really puts us on a glide slope to be the leader in the state. And I want to caution you all about the Guardian program, which I am emphatically opposed to and which uh, the superintendent has publicly stated on numerous times that she is opposed to. After the shooting in Santa Fe, one of the leading proponents of that program did an 180 degree about face and immediately deployed deputy sheriffs onto the uncovered public schools in his county starting on Monday this week. Well, we've been doing that in Citrus County out of Hyde now for several months. We should not take a model that is proven and abandon it out of cost consciousness to really talk about $2.07 per person in our community to protect the lives of our students and our teachers. I'll answer any questions that you might have. I don't quite understand what the problem <coughs> is with the Guardian program, because I understood it to be um, people that were trained by the Sheriff's Office and, and less than deputy status, less than arrest, but, but they, were, they were trained safety officers. We, we had this discussion back in April, uh, Ms. Counts, and what we talked about was the insufficient training that these people have. They have three and a half weeks of training compared to nearly 40 weeks and a decade plus on average of experience as a law enforcement officer. We have trained professionals on our campuses before 214 that had 13.9 years of experience as a deputy sheriff that understands the laws and understands how to operate on our campuses. We've got great you don't have Great. to sell me on the SRO program. Some of them are my kids in the classroom, so I love them. Well, and I, I would dare say they probably are just about everybody so here that I, was I a teacher. And I know you have the benefit of uh, Chairman Dodd, who was a school resource deputy uh, well, during his career. His chairman was SRO number one. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but, but you just heard the conversation about Floral City. So, um, you know, I know we just got the bill for the, the deputies that you did pull off the road and put in other schools, and so I appreciate that. But, um, we don't have a source of income other than Tallahassee and, and the county. Um, we, we, we just have to deal with what we've got. Uh, so we're looking for protection, and we understand, and this is just my personal belief, um, doesn't have anything to do with, with the rest of the board, but our SROs have a gun, but they're, I'm glad that they engaged in Santa Fe. But my problem is, is that one child's probably going to get killed, even if we have an SRO on every campus. 
before the, the button is pushed and everybody comes to help. Because the chance of <clears throat> that shooter coming on our campus, and that's the problem. I'm looking forward to this hardening problem, and, and I'm, so I'm trying to save every penny we can on an SRO because we've got to figure out how to keep these people from coming on our campuses. We can depend on our SROs, but they can't be all over that campus. And so I'm trying to balance out, keep those guys there, because it's not that gun that those guys have. It's the relationship that those SROs have developed with our children in our schools. And those children for years, and I know I was one of them, the children will tell a teacher, they'll tell an administrator, they'll tell an SRO what they're hearing and what they're saying. And I really and truly believe that's what's keeping our children safe. Absolutely. Our school safe. It's not necessarily having that SRO. It's the presence. It's, it's a, the it's full spectrum that that it's a trained professional provides to every campus. So what I'm what I'm looking for in the long run is how to keep all of our community safe. But this community was very emphatic on that half cent sales tax, and school safety was part of that. That and they said no. Commission just said no to you on your impact fee. So we're in this together. <laughs> it, it just seems like it's going to be the sheriff's office and the school board, and we've got to figure out exactly how we can do it. But we don't have any source of income. And I'm going to tell you right now, this we're kind of pleased that this is an underfunded mandate from Tallahassee, because you can't believe how many mandates we get from Tallahassee, and they don't send any money. But we're supposed to do it. Our, our iPads. We, they mandated that we have to produce all these iPads for the kids. didn't send one penny. The idea of Tallahassee um, participating at a full funding, I don't, I, don't, I don't trust. I don't trust that we can rely on that. The, the FTE improved 47 cents a child in our classrooms. That's what Tallahassee thinks of our kids. So I appreciate the fact that you wrote those letters, but we've talked to them and that's exactly how they treat our public schools. So we're in this together and we have to really work out what's best. Um, I'm looking forward to hardening the schools, but my, my concern is keeping these kids from getting on our campus. We had, um, we had two incidences recently, um, and there were other ones, but, but nothing happened. These children are getting guns, and nothing's happening to parents or guardians. They're leaving those guns laying around loose. And I think enforcing some of the gun laws um, might bring a more awareness to these people that have guns available for these kids to, to just pick up and, and shoot with. And we're not doing that. We didn't do anything to, to um, the two incidents that we had here in Citrus County. Um, they walked free and those guns were loose in the house. That's how those kids got them. So I'm looking at other ways that we can do a little bit more to really protect our kids. And I know we have to, to do the money, but um, the Guardian program would be a little bit less than the 1.1 million miles. How, how many of you have sent a letter to the governor, the president, the senator, the speaker of the house, encouraging them to do the same thing that I did in my letter back on March 19th? We not only wrote letters, we, we've been there. We were in Tallahassee. Yeah, so was I. Yeah, and so this was is, I. we got our answer that they sent us the, the 954,000, and it's not enough. All right, board members, any questions for the sheriff? I'm just concerned about. Um, Ms. Bright, could you get your mic there for us? I'm about to turn it on. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm just concerned about um, recurring expenses. That's my biggest concern. If we if we come up with a million whatever this year, what will it be next year, and the year after that, and the year after that? I mean, because we still have teachers to pay, and I don't want to lose teachers. Well, you know, as I talked to uh, Mr. Bishop yesterday, we talked about the fact that uh, we have the mandates that come down from Tallahassee, too. Mm -hmm. And Florida retirement system costs for high-risk employees has gone up 77% since 2011. This year, there's a pretty precipitous uh, incline uh, in the rate for FRS for high-risk and a, a, an increase of significance for workers' compensation. Those human factor costs make up about 80% of our budget. But there's no substitute for having those folks out there. And if we agree to doing this for five years, 
the cost of the vehicles is locked in. It's the cost of what the deputy sheriffs are out there. And of course, as we know, the rate of inflation is not going in, into negative numbers. On the front page of the Chronicle today, they're talking about $3 a, ga a gallon gasoline. It won't be long before they change the, the, the uh, blend on that gas and we see $3 at the pump. In fact, that's the national average as reported last Friday, I believe it was. So the, the, the costs are one thing that we fight very hard to keep down. And as I talked about back in March and again in April, this is our first year. We don't know. The cost may go down. And when I was talking to Mr. Bishop yesterday, I said, you know, until we get good hard data on all of the factors after the first year, we don't know what we've got. But we're being as transparent about the cost associated with this as we possibly can. And I'll tell you another reason, and I talked about this this morning with someone. Another reason why I think there was such a huge failure down in Parkland, I don't have all the facts yet, and Sheriff Galtier, and in fact, uh, Mr. Dodd is part of that, that process. They're dealing with all the facts now and sorting through that to try and write a comprehensive report. But I would dare say that part of the problem down in Parkland was a lack of leadership and a lack of supervision over the SRO program. And that's why we have emphasized to have a good supervisor to SRO ratio out there to ensure that every day that supervisor is out there looking at deputy sheriff in the eyes and talking to them about their program, talking about vulnerabilities, talking about stronghold points to make sure that we adequately protect the students and the faculty. You can't do that with one or two people. You've got to have a good leadership ratio out there and you've got to have that daily interface on the part of those supervisors looking out there. And then when you have those things that occur, whether it's an arrest, a Baker Act, or a court appearance, you've got to have the elasticity of those trained professionals on those campuses who can immediately go back in there and fill in. And that's why it's critical that we have supervision. It's tantamount to that. And we've got, that's why we've got assistant principals in every one of our school camps. And in some cases, we've got two or three. Sheriff, sure. is the, the 1.1 million that you're asking for uh, of the school board, does that include, is that for 25 positions or is that for 24? That's for 25, Mr. Yeah. That, that, that covers the whole thing that we discussed back in April and that we agreed to uh, when we met with the BOCC and right. the superintendent. Well, I just, I, I wanted to clarify that because, you know, the contract we had was only for 15 and we added the 9 is 24, but I know there's a lieutenant that's well, also. We, but we've got 16 deputies right. that were right. deployed as part of that package. And, and so the plan is to keep that, those, the 16 that you have, which was basically a sergeant and lieutenant, and then we're going to add eight more SROs and another sergeant. That's correct. So we would still have, uh, we would, the, the, the lieutenant would still be overseeing the school resource officer program. That's correct. And is that position um, full time or will there be other duties for that person? There will be three full time supervisors over the SRO program. Okay. Okay. I've got a couple other questions. Um, so I've heard uh, from some of the other schools in the in the county that are not public schools, and I, I know you had a meeting uh, with them, um, and there were some concerns. And I've been uh, I've been approached, you know, to find out if you know we had any ability to help their schools for school safety. And obviously, we don't have funding uh, for the private schools. But is there any program that you're going to offer them? Um, that's uh, anything like a hybrid or a guardian program or is it pretty much the same thing the SRO I do not believe in the guardian program it is an untested and unproven program with zero credibility in my opinion and I've been in this business for four decades now protecting lives and being a first responder and a sworn law enforcement officer and I will I will tell you that uh, when we met with him Mr. Dodd it was a very frank conversation is that here are the costs if you want to hire a full-time deputy, if you want an off-duty detail, or if you want a deputy in overtime status, and we walked them through that. And we did look through, as we talked about, whenever we met on March 3rd and April 27th, I believe it was, uh, we talked about looking at a uh, modified program where we could do, um, if it's during the school day, working for a public entity, uh, it has to be an overtime status. 
And that status uh, for that deputy uh, would mean that we would have approximately four folks to cover a couple of campuses mm -hmm. on a rotating basis. And the cost of those four folks would run upwards of about 60000 per person per year. So it, 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 was it, 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 does, it doesn't really amount to any savings uh, other than some of the, the startup costs, but right. long term because you have to pay them time and a half, and that's according to our attorneys, that we would have to pay them time and a half because we already have uh, campuses out there that are covered by full-time uh, employees that um, it would it, it would wash itself out within a few pennies of one another and ultimately it might end up being a more expensive long-term proposition and so the 1.1 million dollars would include agency assigned vehicles to all of those school resources. agency assigned vehicles uh, external defibrillators their weapons, their protective equipment, first aid, radios, everything that they need to protect the lives of the students and the faculty, and as well uh, be there in the event of an unknown emergency that comes up. To include immediately Baker acting or arrest a student uh, or anybody else who might be trespassing on the school campus. Okay. Um, and I don't want to take over all the speaking. I have a couple more questions, but board members, if there's yeah. So, um, you know, I think that what we've been presented here is something we should seriously consider. Um, I do want to stress, though, that um, we're looking at, uh, with the unfunded amount that we'll have to make up, we from the 954 to the 1.1, along with our school security details, which we budgeted $55,000, our school crossing guards, $50,000, our school safety specialists that we're going to have to, to bring on board, which we've already done, and in addition to the monies that we've pledged for the five SROs for the rest of the school year, uh, it comes uh, with the sheriff's plans that we're going to have to look at $444,000, almost $450,000 that we're going to be taking from our unfunded, our undesignated fund balance. And, you know, that is, that's a large amount of money. I mean, those are costs that are associated with school safety. And we have to realize, and, and I, I want the public to realize that that is, to meet this $1.1 million um, and to basically give all of our safe school money and then add to that to bring it to $1.1 million. When we look at these other expenses that's costing, we're looking at almost $450,000. Now, the reason I bring that up is because um, we don't know what's going to happen with the Guardian money coming down from Tallahassee. Um, if we don't, have, well, if we do, do not do the Guardian program, the hopes are that that, that money will be uh, allocated for school resource officers. And it would be my understanding that that money, although I guess, Ms. Hemel, we don't have, we haven't been given an answer how that's going to be dispersed. But the good thing for our board is that we could be seeing some more money coming to the district that could cover what this unfunded balance is. Um, but we don't know when that will happen and we don't know how much that will be for. But are there any, you have any, yeah, is there any? The only thing, Mr. Dodd, with that, <clears throat> specific to that money, in speaking that in the conversations I've had with legislators, they strongly support the Guardian program. And now that there have been a number of districts that are going towards using it, there doesn't seem to be an effort take that money and utilize it elsewhere as we had hoped as we had hoped that they might. There also seems to be indications that the legislature wants to potentially incentivize even more the use of a guardian program or some version of it. And I and I respect very much the sheriff's position on it. I really do. We've had to look at it and I don't think that would be the first, second or third consideration to say is there any version of that that we would be open to? Because the pressure even in the community is, I'm a retired law enforcement officer, I'm a retired military, I am ready to stand for our schools. And that's hard to say to that person, but we can't help you out. We can't do what you want to do. And 
that's that's what the pressure that I believe the public is saying to us. We're ready to stand and do our duty. And the legislators are saying we want those people to do that. I don't know that they're going to give that money over to the SROs. And if they do, I am thrilled. But I just don't know that, that we can count on that. So to me, that's money that either we just won't be able to use or that we're just going to have to plan out for. But Sheriff, if that money were to be made available, that would come to the school district, correct? That, that's correct, yes. Okay. And uh, also, Mr. Dodd, um, I have participated in the LBC process in the past as a state agency head. I know how the process works. And I also know that if we unite at the hips and go to Tallahassee and we get our colleagues from around the state, especially in light of what happened on Friday, we have a unified message. And there is a heck of a lot of strength when we show up for that LBC meeting and we go up there and talk passionately about why we want to see a reallocation. And coincidentally, you mentioned about $450,000. Uh, rough order of magnitude based on my math of how that money gets apportioned out, I see between $450,000 to $650,000 that could potentially come to the Citrus County School Board for us to redeploy to protect our students as we bridge the first year of implementation of SB 7026. And to Mr. Kennedy's point, Texas is an open carry state. How many people ran towards the sound of gunfire in an open carry state on Friday to protect the lives of those students and the faculty that were being shot and killed on that school campus? I can tell you, zero. I talked to an FBI SAC just yesterday about that very thing. The only one that was there until backup arrived was a sworn law enforcement officer from the sheriff's office. And he risked his life to protect students and faculty. There's no substitute for having that trained professional with decades plus of experience out there. And we've got a great program. It's always the challenge in finding the right amount of money to go and fund it. But that's why we're here. We're talking passionately about something because we believe that school safety is paramount for our children. We care about our staff and faculty as well. They're not only members of our community and they're not only parents, but they spend a long time getting to where they are in their careers. And we want to assure them that they are as safe there as they are in their own living room or doing anything else across the community. This is a very powerful, powerful opportunity for us to be that pace setter for the state and for the nation. And, and I dare say, after a conversation I had today, that um, maybe we ought to also turn up the heat with our congressional delegation. And maybe we also ought to turn up the heat with the folks at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue. There's a reason why there hasn't been a terrorist attack using an airplane in the United States of America since September 11, 2001. There's a reason why our courtrooms are safe and our judges are safe because we deliberately put money where our mouth is when it comes to talking about protecting the lives of people who are dependent upon others to safely transit and do business or actually travel to one location from their hometown and back. I, I am very passionate about this. I want our students protected as you do. We've got to find the money to be able to do this. I have cut this to the very core and found a way to save 200 plus thousand dollars in addition to what we've already talked about to get this off the ground. And now we're talking about, I still, I still have work to do with the BOCC and I, I, I make no, in, intention that uh, indication here that that's a done deal but with your support and assistance in closing that gap we can have a very frank conversation with the BOCC and the public about us getting this right for the 2018-2019 school year I do not want us to fail at this <clears throat> go ahead Ms. Uh, uh, as Thomas said excuse me uh, many of the people talk about the guardian program and then they offer their experience and they're very experienced people many in fact most from the state of Florida retired a few years maybe five years maybe more uh, but they they would like to be part of helping and you object to the guardian program 
would you tell us exactly what that program entails and training for the individuals who would be guardian and why you object to it so you can tell them why you say, well, thank you, but, but we would rather go a different way? It's called standards, Miss Powers. The standards to become a sworn law enforcement officer in the state of Florida are very exact and demanding. The psychological background investigation is very exact and very demanding. The supervision and insurance that we put against this to have a very lengthy field training officer program and then recurring training over the course of that person's career makes them manifestly better at doing their job than a person that gets three and a half weeks of training. I'm fundamentally opposed to a program that I said previously was untried, completely untested, and heretofore has no positive results to show us as a model of a way to do this. The model that works here in Citrus County and indeed across the state is having a sworn, trained law enforcement officer that's either a deputy sheriff or a municipal police officer on very limited bases but still backed up by municipal police departments and county sheriff's offices is to have a sworn criminal justice standards and training commission uh, professional law enforcement officer that's there. I have concerns about the Guardian program that I'm not prepared to go into every detail here today because that wasn't the substance of why I was asked to come here. I was asked to come here and talk about a delta of $310,000 that we can, we can work together towards closing the gap on and make this not a problem, make it a solution. Now, if my 40 years of doing this as a sworn law enforcement officer is not good enough, then I don't know who is. But I will tell you, there's nobody that's been in this business longer than me that's currently serving as a law enforcement officer in this community. And we should not look for the cheapest solution. Cheaper is not better. Cheaper is just cheaper. The people I'm speaking of actually are retired uh, Florida law enforcement sheriff's deputies, so, so they had all the training you're talking about. And, and if they, they would like to come back and become a full-time employee, I will bring them back in if they can meet the standards and they can pass the, the psychological evaluation, which is mandatory. We've been doing it for a very long time, but it is now mandatory for every sworn law enforcement officer that's going to be a school resource well, I, think I think that's great. And their purpose is, is not uh, to look at cheaper. Their purpose is to help. They know they have the training. They want to put that training to use to be able to help us. Not, so not if, to get in the, if, in the we, if we had a and sworn... I don't know why, uh, what to say to them. Say, if, thank you, but, but we, we can't do that right if, now. If we had a sworn law enforcement officer on 16 campuses and we had guardians on six campuses, which campuses do you think would be identified as targets and easy opportunities? See, I know some of the people that I'm talking about that have volunteered I, and, and I know so some very good. So to, uh, to answer that question, is they have very good training so they would be good, but I don't know about the others that you're talking about that aren't a former sheriff deputies. I don't know anything about them. And I'll, another question I had, you were talking about uh, monies for five years for leasing the cars, is that? It's a five-year lease commitment on our part to lease those vehicles. Why Why is that? Like if you lease a car off, you do it for a year, not No, ma'am. I, I don't know anybody that leases you a vehicle for a year, but the agreement that we can do that's the most cost-effective is a five-year lease, and it's through a nationwide leasing company that is leasing vehicles to a multitude of sheriff's offices, and we're currently using them as a uh, leasing platform for some of our vehicles. Well, the amount then for five years is the same amount, like whatever it is, for the five years? No, ma'am. It goes up about $10,000 a year over the cost of the life of the lease. So it's an additional $50,000 over the cost of those five years. And that's why the, um, the operating cost goes from 301 to about 310 uh, for the remainder of the funds that need to be put in there. And that information was provided to Mr. Bishop yesterday when we talked about uh, the, uh, the, the difference between the programs and the cost savings. So it defers the upfront cost of $216,000. It also defers a lease payment over 90 days because the manufacturer of the vehicle is so backed up right now because of the demand that we won't be able to get those vehicles leased and into the uh, pipeline of the agency until um, probably October 1st. 
So the other departments you, you're speaking of, they also are under a five-year lease obligation? They are. Sheriff, I've got a question um, in regards to your letter. I just want to make sure because it sounds like um, we are, we've closed the gap. I mean, you've really done a good job, I think, with these figures. You know, when we met at one time, you know, we were looking at $238,000 in, in, in differences, and now we're, we're right around 300000 which I think is right in, in the ballpark. But yet your letter led us to believe that, you know, we were $600,000 in, you know, off. So I guess this has all happened since you responded to no, the it, No, it has not, Mr. Dodd. No. When you and I talked back in April and again on May 3rd, we talked about how we could close that gap, but since I did not get a response back from the superintendent or the school board after our meetings, uh, I went forward with the basic information that we had, which showed the uh, startup costs uh, for the capital and operating, and then the uh, recurring costs going forward. So again, to reemphasize for everybody for clarification, $216,000 comes off of that amount for operating and capital expenses if we go with the lease option. And it still leaves a delta that needs to be closed, and I suggest that the we could use the, um, the impact fee money uh, that has $176,000 in it to help us close that gap of $87,000. Uh, we've we've uh, submitted an invoice for the $96,000 from uh, y'all to help us uh, with some of those costs. So all, all of those things right there leave us by reducing that amount that was in my letter that I sent last week to the superintendent down to less than half of what it was so whenever I sent that letter. Right, so basically you were... That the letter didn't incorporate the savings on the lease. No, you taking that off off the top, then we're looking at about 146,000 more that we're going to pay, and then you're going to go to the county on the impact fees on the on what's in the account right now. Is that kind of what you'd said? My my quest for the funding would be to go and talk to the the BOCC about the impact fee to close the gap for eighty seven thousand four hundred and six dollars. $406.66, it would leave unfunded $310,658 as a shortfall. And if we go back to what was agreed upon in the meeting with the BOCC, a 50-50 split of that would be $155,329. Sheriff, on the impact fee, and I hope you can't get that I'm, I'm I'm praying already <laughs> so the question though to, that I would have too is have we checked to see if if it's impact fee fundable to utilize that because I know the requirements we, 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 we believe that, that, you, that you have a case that you can make on that okay and my concern too with the commissioners is they have expressed it appeared reading the paper that they expressed not not agreeing to that they wanted to use impact fee monies for SROs. Now, I appreciate that you said that does, that's not how I'm going to operate, that we're going to do what's right for kids and safety, and that's how I'm going to make my decisions. I believe that's the sense of what I'm getting from you, sir. Well, as, as it was the, um, at the last BOCC meeting, there were two that voted in favor of reinstatement. Okay. So that means that we only need one, need more. one more. <laughs> yes, sir. Sheriff, one question for clarification, and it is with the most respect that I'm asking this. So please, please do understand. Um, I have great respect for the service you had for our country. We benefit every day by you holding the lines of keeping our country safe and now our county. Um, the Guardian program, I struggle with a lot of the things you've talked about. I mean, I agree with a lot of things you've talked about in struggling to support it. Where I wonder is, God willing, we get an SRO on every campus, which is what our desire has always been in this county. Do we then look at, or do, do you as sheriff say, I would be open to a guardian, a limited, very controlled guardian option as an added layer of protection that worked directly with, with my <coughs> force? Because that, that's where I sit there and say, okay, if we don't have money going forward other than where we're at, could that, whether that's resources or even just man resources, be something that we get to 
in the future? And, then, and I know you don't have a crystal ball and you can't entirely say, but it would be nice to say if I have more good, good guns on campuses than bad guns. And, but I understand the first defense is SROs. Is that something? I would like to gather the data subsequent to this and not only look at what my colleagues at the national level are doing and that we have good peer-reviewed research to rely upon, but I would also like to sit there and go through it with my staff to make sure that we do the proper analysis of it. Again, um, the thing that uh, most recently, you know, we're talking about the Texas being an open carry state and nobody responded. Um, Florida is a concealed carry state, and we've had some instances not at schools, but at other things that occurred where folks had concealed carry weapons and they ran away from gunfire instead of running towards it. And not for a public discussion, but in a very private discussion off the record with me talking to you because of the safety concerns I have for folks, I would love to walk you through the nightmare scenario that I have woken up at two o'clock and three o'clock in the morning thinking about uh, because I am the, the one scenario that scares me to death and, and should scare all of us to death uh, is a real possibility. And, um, I, I understand. There's, there's something about this uniform and whether I've got somebody in that uniform over there or that uniform over there or a known person on my team that makes me feel a lot more comfortable when it comes to this and protecting our students. And uh, I, I'd be happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with each of you uh, about that because it, it is very scary to think about what the consequences could be in a situation like that. Pardon, Ms. I think bottom line today is if we need the direction, if we can agree with the sheriff plan of funding $1.1 million, which would be for a five-year plan in our contract. A couple of things, though, um, that have to be open with the sheriff and with the board. I want to be very clear in the public that I know that every one of you, kid safety is our number one priority. We all appreciate, respect the SRO program. It's been one of the best that's been recognized in the nation. That would be every one of our goals today, that an SRO on campus. Now, I listened to the board, and I've talked to many board members, so here's some of the questions Chair Prima Gass said. He referred to the three supervisors for the 22 officers. I'm not telling you if that's enough, too many. That's not my job. But we talked about our principals and our APs, and you mentioned that earlier. We do have three APs at the high school, but we also have 1,500 kids based on four administrators. So I know those are questions that board members have asked, that do we need all those supervisors? If we can agree to an amount of money the sheriff can leave here today, and then we know that on August, whatever date that is, 2nd, 3rd, 4th, 10th, whatever day that is, that he can put an SRO, SRO officer on each campus. To me, that's where we need to be today. We can find the $1.1 million. Yes, we'll go into the fund balance and take that out. But he came yesterday, met Mr. Bishop, about those dollars. And if you all can agree to move forward with that, we can lock that in for five years. I think that it's a plan that we probably need to move forward on. I know the Guardian program has been out in the public. I'm asked about it every single day from the current officers that they feel like that they've got experience to it. That could be a hybrid if they could be something different. Then I know that you've all been asked that question and the sheriff's been adamant about his decision on that. None of us wanted at the beginning to offer anyone on staff, teachers, anybody. I don't know that any of our staff could shoot at a student. And I've been adamant about that. They should not be part of the Guardian program. So, Again, bottom line today is we need direction on where you all want us to go because if you feel like that we can move forward with that 1.1 million, I'm adamant about that 1.1 because I think that's been a, a meet in the middle dollar amount for us to move forward to have an on each campus. Okay, so I'm looking at, at your letter, um, superintendent's letter to, to you on the 16th. And one of the third question was, are you willing to continue the agreement we currently have with the SRO program? So would, would this, this contract that was read from 2017, 2018, are we talking about that agreement at 1.1 million? It'll, you can just. Oh, there, there, there would be a whole new agreement. 
there'll be a new agreement with Right, there would have to be a new agreement that was drafted. Right, and then we discussed... Um, and and just, just so this doesn't come, you know, everything's out on the table, we cannot enter into a five-year lockdown contract. It has to be based on appropriations. It has to be based on the budget. We don't know what money we're going to get next year. So I would have to put a non-appropriations clause in there that says that if the state of Florida decreases our funding, you know, then we are, you know, although this is a priority of funding, you know, when it gets down to the end of the day, you cannot, it is, you cannot pledge monies that you do not have. You cannot pledge next year's budgetary monies without having it out. Right, well, are we literally talking about, I mean, I thought we would do an annual contract. They were talking about a five-year contract. Yeah. Yeah. contract. What I have to have, if I if I agree to lease five vehicles, or nine vehicles for five years, I, I have to have a guaranteed income stream to pay for that. So if we want to entertain the lease agreement as a separate uh, addendum to the contract, I think our attorney would would uh, support that. Um, and then we'll look at the, the cost. And as I, as I mentioned months ago, I think back in early March, uh, after we chew up our numbers and see where we are, and I mentioned this to Johnny Bishop yesterday when we were meeting, you know, we, we may see a little bit of a decrease uh, in some of the costs. I'm, I'm, I'm an optimist, but I'm also very pragmatic when Tallahassee sends down some of these additional uh, cost factors that are there when it comes to increasing FRS and workers' comp uh, rates. So, I, you know, we, we, can, we can come up with a, a way to skin that and make sure that that happens so that um, we, we at least cover the leases. Now, there is a clause in there that will say that in any particular year, if we don't get enough money budgetarily from the state of Florida or whatever to cover all of our other costs, we have the right to back out of the contract. I mean, because we cannot, it is, you cannot pledge monies on a multi-year contract without having at least a yearly non-appropriations clause or a 30-day out, which I know you don't, you don't want to cancel it within 30 days. Otherwise, it becomes a bond and you have to go to the voters. Right. No, I, I, I think we can work work that out, Wes. And, yeah, I just and, don't want that to be a, a shock or anything no. else. You know? But I, I also am, am very cognizant of the fact that nobody in Tallahassee among those 120 House members and 40 Senate members is going to commit political suicide when it comes to this. This is going to be the number one topic when the legislature comes back into session next March. And they'll have a lot of time between the election in November and their subsequent scoring in after the uh, Secretary of State uh, certifies the election results and, and the commencement of session in March to get a lot of feedback from us and as well from the citizens across the state that really want to ensure that we're protecting the, the tens of thousands of students that show up on every public school campus every day, hundreds of thousands. So I, 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 all, all I'm concerned about is it's, it's a substantial lease for us to lease nine vehicles and we just wanna make sure that that's there. But I'm, I'm confident that that money's gonna be there. And as I spoke with Mr. Bishop yesterday, I also mentioned you know, there's a really good chance that they will look at putting additional funds towards this program next year to help us out. Um, sooner or later, uh, you know, paying down our debt and everything else has to take a back seat to some of these other projects that are out there that are screaming for additional help back here in the communities and in our counties. And Tallahassee has to take the lead in that. So I, I think we're going to see some uh, sea change discussions coming coming forward. And like I said. Um, I'm very committed to the legislative process and going to Tallahassee to represent our interests to ensure that we're doing everything humanly possible to protect our students and our and our faculty and staff. All right, Mr. Kennedy. And, and Sheriff, I, I know you will. Um, we'll do what we can to be supportive of you in every way, both physically in, and in any way you, you, you need support on that. The concern we have to balance, too, is we want those resources from the state we can't lose more school resources and funding to get there because that's going to only make the challenge of school safety even harder if we have students that are failing because we can't provide the necessary services. I know you know that. I just want to make sure I share that to the public. I appreciate you also trying to be willing to work with us as far as how to structure a contract, um, recognizing what Mr. Um, uh, Bradshaw had just said. Thank you. <laughs> Um, the question I would say is if 
unfortunately, if for some reason we found that, that there was some reason we couldn't go forward, we had to reduce funding or something, and we had this issue on, on the contracts with the lease, would you be able to use those elsewhere in your fleet and not in that subsequent year, let's say, not have to lease more vehicles and, and reduce that? And I'm thinking if that's the case, then I'm, I'm not sure we're probably all on the same page at this point. I feel like that's where we are at. The, ch the challenge would be is if the FTEs go away, then the need for the vehicles and the equipment goes away as well. Thank you. So the, the FTE generates the equipment set that we've very comprehensively listed out for everybody. Um, a deputy requires a vehicle, a radio, a weapon, and all of that other equipment to outfit them to properly do their job on every school campus, just like every other patrol deputy does. So, uh, again, I, I and think I'm looking at it like a bus. Like we have to buy buses every year in a rotation. So if I if I got for some reason an extra bus, then I wouldn't be buying a bus, even though I'm not going to get any more kids. I've got to replace that. So that's why I was trying to understand if there was a way that that could go back into the fleet rotation on the fleet vehicle. That's what that was really. It, my but it, it still has a different cost factor associated with it. The preference is to buy the vehicles um, uh, because it is a cheaper proposition if we have the capital funds uh, initially in the budget here to be able to buy them. Um, it it's it saves the taxpayers money, and that's what we're trying to do to save the taxpayers the maximum amount of money. But within the confines of the limitations of the funding that we've got this option does provide us a different mechanism to defer some of those costs up front for startup and that's that's was the best possible outcome that we could achieve um, when we first started talking about this mr dodd and i did thank you and so i, I want to get back to the contract for a minute mr bradshaw so we have an annual contract here and what you're saying is we can't commit to money that we don't have so would this continue to be and the sheriff even pointed out which i agree there's going to be a lot of changes this next year which could be to our benefit absolutely so couldn't we construct a, a, a one-year a contract for an annual agreement with some type of wording on the lease vehicles um, or i mean how do you see, you see the lease this is going separate from the contract or i mean in here right now we've got a 90-day termination and 180 day termination without cause right um, so you know there's that's not, that's not what the sheriff was asking for the sheriff right. was asking for a five-year commitment because he's going to want to go to lease vehicles he needs he's going to sign a lease with whatever company that it is to lease the vehicles to fund to to provide the, for the sros and he wants some type of an assurance that it's going to continue on for five years to be able to cover the, the lease payments on it. I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, please. That's correct. You know, but we normally and historically have entered into one-year contracts with the sheriff's office for the SRO program. To enter into any type of a multi-year contract, you are not allowed to pledge monies that you don't have. You don't know what your budget's going to be next year until you know the the state sets the millage rate. You know all the taxes come in, all those types of things. So in order to enter into multi-year agreements, you either have to have a convenient a termination for convenience clause, which is 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, whatever. That one is longer because you don't want to have. We're going to terminate this in 30 days, and you're trying to figure out what to do within 30 days to put SROs on campus. Or you, or you have to have a non-appropriations clause, which says that if if the state, when they, if our budget is less next year, then you know we're going to try to make sure that this is one of the priorities. But you know when it comes down to it, there are certain mandated things, which this is one of them. But it, we, you cannot pledge that, otherwise it becomes what's a bond, you have to go to the voters, you know, it's kind of like bonding when we build schools, and you don't want to do that. So that's why there has to be a non-appropriations clause within there that says if we have a budget shortfall, this is one thing we want to look at to terminate. Um, but we can't enter into a five-year agreement on paper. With a non-appropriations clause. Yes. But we don't know what the, the annual amount's going to be. I mean, it's 1.1 million this year. Are you talking, you're going to lock us in at 1.1 million for five years? That's not what you're offering, is it, Sheriff? I can't do that. 
I don't, well, know, what, I don't know what costs are, but more importantly, as I discussed uh, just a few minutes ago, what if the cost next year comes up to one million fifty thousand dollars? Do you want to pay me one point one million dollars? I'm sure the BOCC would appreciate that. <laughs> right. So that's what I'm, I'm trying to get a picture of what I'm going to. Are we going to have two separate contracts in? I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, the cost of the lease and the vehicles and the capital costs and everything else to to put an SRO is the sheriff's. He, he that's his number. So, I mean, I, I don't, maybe I'm unsure as to what you're asking me to try to draft. Well, I would like, what I'm thinking is we have a, a, a one-year agreement for $1.1 million. It's spelled out in here, the positions, the schools are covered, all those things in this contract that we have coming due that takes effect for our budget year, July 1. And, but then to meet the sheriff's request or desire to have a commitment on the lease, maybe we should have something separate. Is, Rather what about having the one year with with up to four consecutive year renewals subject to the terms that you you referenced because then you would be still doing the one year of the 1.1 and then the subsequent renewals subject to the things that we talked about because we we're not going to know our funding the sheriff's not going to know fully his expenses that could change but the idea is to still try and have some protection, particularly I'm assuming going to the Board of County Commission, going to the lease and having to say to them that you, you know, he needs to have some protection. I'm assuming to say I have, a, I have an agreement with the school board for a multi-year, five-year contract. I'm comfortable moving forward with that. I'm, I'm, assuming, I'm thinking that's what you're looking for that you're needing. But well, the U.S. is saying you, we you cannot do, do that. I can do a, a, you can do a contract that says that it will, it will <coughs> renew, you know, and with a with a 90 day termination clause in there that if any party wants to terminate it, they can terminate it within 90 days of the end of the contract. The the challenge is that either I buy the vehicles or I lose the vehicles. There's no other option. I've got 15 vehicles I need to send to auction right now that are sitting on some of our public school campuses and we're, we're doing what, you know, what we're doing. <laughs> um, but they're all going to auction. Just as, as soon as the school year ends on Thursday, um, we're going we're gonna to take those up and, and get rid of them because they're, they're not drivable. My understanding was he wanted a five-year, the sheriff wanted a five-year commitment. And so, uh, however y'all do it is fine, but that's why you would have to have, so if you're going to enter into an agreement that, you know, for five years there has to be an out good for us to, to, to get out of the contract, either based upon convenience or based upon money. I would say that, a one that given a, a, whether it's a one-year contract with a multiple renewals subject to the legislative funding mechanism that you're talking about, gives me comfort of what we're dealing with. My concern would be is I want to make sure he has enough that he doesn't go to the, the Board of County Commission and they go, well, you got 30 days notice, school board's out of here, and, and he doesn't have enough comfort. Or he, does, he doesn't have enough to be able to, to, to convince them. And so that would be what I would just say for as a board, we have to be cognizant of, we want him to be able, we want the sheriff to be able to sell this to the Board of County Commission that's, that would be my reasoning, Mr. Dodd, for saying I could use that if we have protection in the contract. Would be positive thing. Twenty-five years of entering into annual contracts with the sheriff's office and the county law and the contract record. Right. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> uh, of doing it. And that's what I'm thinking. And if the if the lease becomes a problem um, because of our lack of funding, then that would be the time for the county commission to stick up, and the county needs to support. Um, any any downfall after that so I'm I would entertain the one year because it's still all unknown um, I applaud your your trust to go to Tallahassee as a group but you know we've got a lot of the counties that are using this guardian program and it's less expensive than ours we're not all going to be at the hip uh, and that might be the state saying oh well we'll fund this but we're not going to fund that and we're choosing to stay with our SRO program um, so We've got to keep it. We've got to keep it legal because we have a duty to our taxpayers, just like you do, uh, to do their wisely. I can't see stretching that without that that clause that that Wes Watson there. Uh, one year is all we can really commit to. 
um, and we appreciate the fact that leasing is less expensive than a car, but um, you know, we're, we're going into the fund and that's going to affect, and this is what the commissioners need to hear when they're not participating with us, is that you know, the first two things that, that people call about when they're moving to a county is they call your website and they look for the rest reports and the pedophile reports and they look at our school reports and the minute we touch that bond issue, our report is lessened. So it's, it's, it, this is going to affect the, the county commissioners, whether they want to or not. So I think looking to them maybe for the second, third, or fourth, but again, I go on our track record. We, we've done this for since 1984-85, and we haven't not signed a contract with our sheriff's office to protect our schools. So I think you have to voice a little bit of confidence in us. Well, Ms. Counts, I, I, for the record, um, and I, I get the report every day from Tallahassee, uh, a majority of the counties are not doing the Guardian program. In fact, it's less than 10% of the counties in the state of Florida that have signed up to participate in the Guardian program. And that was prior to the school shooting in Santa Fe uh, at the high school last Friday. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, one of the leading proponents of that as a cost-saving measure did an about face, meaning turned 180 degrees immediately after that, and it was all over the news before the five o'clock news started that that particular sheriff put a sworn, trained, many years experience deputy sheriff on every campus of every public school in his county on Monday morning. And they also banned backpacks on their public school campuses for the remainder of the week. Uh, as did many other uh, communities across the state. So, um, all, all I've got a concern about is we're, we're deferring an expense of $216,000. I have zero independent taxing authority as the sheriff, but I am a constitutional officer. And if I'm going to obligate my office to purchase through a lease vehicle instead a purchase purchase uh, vehicle program, then it's, it's incumbent upon me to be uh, responsible to the taxpayers and the citizens who put me in this office and trust me to go and do this and be a leader is that I know that the money's going to be there to pay for it. Because right now I have zero money in my budget to pay for it. I've got 15 vehicles that I need to send to auction immediately. And I've got to replace those vehicles to be able to put them on, um, put, a, put a deputy sheriff in there to be able to go and serve the needs of uh, the community. So, Mr. Bradshaw, is that something we could do with a separate uh, commitment or, or without it being a contract, or are you, would you go with what like Mr. Kennedy has been no, I, I think that's going to cause us problems with the auditor if we enter yes. a separate contract to lease yeah. vehicles and then the vehicles aren't being used 100% of the time for school use. Right. Okay. So, how then do we, uh, are we going to use some wording in the contract? I mean, I do agree, Sheriff, our track record is pretty good. Um, so what would suffice um, in the contract that says that, you know, we're going to agree to the sheriff's vehicle lease program? I don't think we put anything in there that says we agree to the sheriff's vehicle lease program. The sheriff has presented us with a number of what it's going to cost for him to, to do that. He's not asking, yes, you know, as far as, you know, bulletproof vest or ammo or any of the other costs that go up and down. I mean, it's, it's, it's a number. You know, the, the problem is, is that his number is based upon his ability to be able to lease vehicles for five years to drive the cost down from what he had originally started at. Our problem is, is that you cannot commit funds that you do not have. So you cannot, you know, you cannot say that we will pay this for four or five years because you don't know what happens if like in 08 when the property taxes drop to nothing, you know, and, and, and drove everything down. There has to be a way for us to look at it and say, we have to redo this whole program or, or have it out. It is this law, okay. there's a Supreme Court case on it that says okay. you cannot commit your funds, you know, next year's funds for so, Sheriff, how is that going to be something? I mean, you hear our commitment here with the program. If we can't put that in the contract, is there a way you could look to absorb, if there were to be some type of major loss of funding, to absorb those nine vehicles into your 
your, your fleet program as far as your replacements. But, but I will, if, if I... So, you know, so, you know, when you... It, and it is, it says, I mean, the law says that we have to partner with the law enforcement agency to, to, us, uh, to us at least assign or put one or more people on, on campus. Okay, so it's not, you know, when I talk about the non-appropriations clause and different things like that, you know, it's, from a legal standpoint, I have to have it in there. But I am assuming that this is one of the programs that y'all are going to work Would it be possible, and, and it's, a, it's a group conversation, but is, would it be possible to then put a cap then, a percentage cap on an annual basis, whether that's tied to, you know, to some portion of the contract to say whether it's two to and a half percent, not to exceed that, um, would that as as cause as anything? I mean, those types of things, you, you know, it all comes out in, the, in negotiating as far as what the amount is. You can tie the amount into, you know, if you can increase funding next year in school safety, in, in your school safety money, and, and and that drives down the, you know, the cost, or it can decrease over time. Based upon you know what the sheriff was saying, I mean that those some of those things can be you know renegotiated on an annual basis. You can have a, a, a contract say that you know that the parties will meet 90 days before the end to renegotiate some of the terms of it. I know we are trying to, to make a decision. More than the next I know we're trying to make a decision today. Wonder if it just would help to maybe take a 10 minute break and just no. Okay. Let me, let me do this. Let me help you. Sure. Is, is this number, and I apologize, is this number contingent upon the Board of County Commissioners releasing the 175000 to you? If you go over there and they say no, does this number change at that point in time? I wouldn't want to be walking through that political minefield if I were them, but that's well, just my are, opinion. Well, I understand that, but they already said we're not going to reinstitute impact fees to, to yeah. help fund SROs, and, and we're not raising any taxes and everything else. I don't think some people are more We, we need to convince that. one of the five, one of the three who voted no. But and, I, and I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> but, I understand yes. but I think it's important that, you know, because your number of 310,000 will change if they say we're not giving you the $175,000 in impact fees. Well, we're not asking for the 175000 in impact fees. We're only asking for 86000 and or 87406 uh, dollars and sixty six cents okay, out of the impact fee amount. Okay, does that number does, does, does your three hundred ten uh three oh one three seventy nine change? It's it actually change? it is uh, based on the doing the lease option, it becomes three hundred and ten six fifty eight divided by two. one fifty five three twenty nine for the school board, one fifty five three twenty nine for the uh, board of county commissioners to supplement the budget. And uh but does the 310 change if they don't give you the 87? Possibly. Possibly. But here's here's what... And, and the only reason I'm asking because the, the 1.1 is not firm then either. We, we have to come to an agreement here before we can go back to the BOCC. That, that, they, they made that very emphatically clear when we met with them. This, and, and I know that uh, Mr. Dodd has had several meetings with the chairman, and we are, we are very clear. That's why we've, we've done everything humanly possible. Here's what I need from, from you five um, folks right here. Look me in the eyes and tell me that you're committed to this program. Yes, sir. Y yes. And, and continuing the 20 plus years of legacy that we've got in this program, if you can do that, I won't sit here and demand of you a five year agreement. Sir, I think I, that's exactly what we want to tell you right now. So, okay. we're, we're, I so, believe we are trying very hard to say, let's work this I, conversations out. Again, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to be fiscally responsible and give you every option that we can to protect our students and we all want that same outcome at the end of the day so 
we've, we've, we've compromised an awful lot. I can't tell you how many times uh, Chairman Dodd and I have sat in a closed room, just the two of us, and he's had his calculator out and a pencil and a piece of paper and written numbers down. And uh, I've worked with my finance director and my major over law enforcement operations, and uh, we, we, have, we have cut every bit of other stuff out there, we, but we've, we've got to outfit these deputies properly. They've got to be trained properly. And we've got to get them out on those campuses. And time is of the essence. So if if I've got a commitment from y'all to continue this great relationship, um, I'm I, I won't worry about that. Let's let's get this done. Let's get and then let's go out there and go present this as a unified front to the BOCC and help us close that. The impact fee money is sitting there. Let's use it. And it's going to, isn't it already set to go back automatically into place in August of this year anyway? So even if they do nothing, the impact fees are going to start back up. And that money is sitting there to help us with the capital expenses. I mean, I agree. It's just that the way that they were going to vote on the 1.1, because that's a firm number, that was going to change. It should be contingent upon the OCC. You know. we, we can pull this across the finish line. Sheriff, first of all, I cannot thank you enough for coming today. And I would encourage you, please come more often. We love our sheriff's department. We love our SROs. These are family. I talk, you know, Sherry, Ms. Turnage knows I talk about SRO number one because we are so grateful that we have a family here. SRO number three, you know, badge number three. We don't talk about number two because he's retired. <laughs> um, we are our family. My, my wife, my daughter, every day are protected by your officers. I know your officers, many of them by name. My family's grown up with them side by side. These aren't two agencies. This is one family. I will tell you, if for no other reason why I want to keep the SROs, it is because of the legacy because of the respect I have for the men and women, and for the hope that even some of those that are maybe working in other divisions will come back to the SRO program because I have so much faith in them. Yeah, the numbers are tough, and we are worried, as you are, of how we're going to do it because we can't tax. It may look like we can tax, but we can only tax what Tallahassee tells us to. So that's what worries us just like it does you, and we want to be fiscally responsible. I will tell you, this board member is ready to say to you today, let's get it on, let's do this. So if you can agree to work with us and we can do this for a year, and I will be here, God willing, a year from now, and I'm ready to go forward again. So let's make that happen. And that was one of my concerns too, and I said that the relationship that our SROs have with our kids is really what keeps us safe. And I've been up at night many times thinking of, of Casey Phillips going home with all that slobber on his kneecaps because of all the kids' <laughs> rock pressure puggies. And I've gone into Chris River High School and I see really children come up and hug Jimmy. And so that really He's a big teddy bear. He's a big teddy He was my teddy bear when he was a sophomore. Uh, but He'll become a grizzly though if he needs to. Yes. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I, and that's why I think you can have that confidence that we're going to deal with you because the one thing that really has bothered me since all of this came down from Tallahassee is these relationships that our SROs that have been in our schools for years have with our children. And I really and truly believe that's what's keeping them safe. And so I didn't, I didn't want to change that. I didn't want to have you absorb um, you know, 16 deputies and have them out there on patrol uh, when they've established these relationships over the years with the kids. Um, and we have some very, very good SROs. And when, I know one time we complained about an SRO that didn't come out of his office and not develop those relationships and our sheriff moved him. Uh, so we've had that partnership for years. It's not gonna go away. The only thing that we're struggling with now is what Tallahassee, you have more faith in them than I do. And I've only been at this a little over a year. So, um, but it's just, it's the almighty dollar. We still have to provide books, we have iPads, teacher salaries. We, we promised those teachers a raise last year for a three year program. Um, going into our fund balance is, is gonna diminish the reputation that a school system has as, as people wanna move here. 
but um, I don't want to see that relationship that, that our SROs have developed in, in our schools disappear. Thank you. This comes to my group Thank you, Ms. Brown. And I, I would wish that those people who did volunteer out of the goodness of their hearts, uh, as far as guardians, if, if you could find maybe a place for them to volunteer, to do something, to give back, because that's what they want. They're not looking at our uh, salaries or monies or anything. I'm even willing to make a motion, but I have two quick questions, and you can do this. Focus program. I love it. Yeah. I absolutely do. And that's, you know, when you go to this focus graduations, which I think I've got one today at 1.30 at La Canto Primary School, if I remember correctly, um, that you talk about feeling the love. Every one of those students goes up and hugs that uh, school resource deputy and lets them know how much they appreciate it. You said Lacanto, you're going to be at? I, I think it's Lacanto. Is, is I was going to say, Mr. Cri uh, Deputy Cridlin, who yes, I think it's was famous. Uh, yeah, yes, it's Lacanto. He was pretty famous uh, yesterday on Facebook for, uh, for his duties. So, uh, focus. So, thank you. And a very near and dear trip to my heart because I believe it builds those lifelong relationships with those SROs and with the entire community of deputies is the Washington, D.C. trip. Uh, I plan on doing it this year. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm going to go up. Uh, unfortunately, I can't go for the whole trip, but I'm going up for a couple of days of the trip because awesome. it is so impactful, and I absolutely want to continue that. We love it. We know it produces great results, and it gets young students excited about citizenship in this great country of ours. With that, I'm um, willing to make a motion that we except going into entry into a uh, contract for all of our schools for one year at 1.1 million dollars um, and i believe it's the sheriff's responsibility and his to to, to know how that money spent so i'm uh, not putting anything other than i think that in my motion okay, okay we have a motion uh, by mr kenny a second by Ms. counts uh, now, uh, Mr. Kennedy, I, I assume that the motion for the $1.1 million that we we're talking about, the 25 positions, I mean, do we need to clarify that in the motion? It'll, it'll be clarified, but I'm, I just, yeah, it's right. to cover the program. So it's going to be, be 22 school sites covered plus the three additional. Three supervisors. I really believe that, that the sheriff has shown that he's, uh, I, and I don't want to cap him one way or the other, he's putting resources in our schools every day probably more than at times the number of officers that we're talking about and so I just don't want to necessarily you know limit it one way or the other so that's why I say that however legal needs to to address those I'm, I'm open to okay that was my reason for right. that's very good okay we have a motion and a second um, is there other discussion or questions for the sheriff or the superintendent anyone else uh, have Mr. Mr. Bradshaw Mr. Bradshaw contract. Yeah. yes sir. <laughs> now this contract uh, takes place July 1st. Uh, it's the renewal of our contract, right, uh, Mr. Bradshaw? It, it'll be a renewal contract, yes. Sir. We have two meetings in June. Yes. yes. Um, and then we will be. It should be on the agenda. We've got a motion second, $1.1 million school resource officer program. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, motion passes 5-0. Sheriff, thank you for coming in. And, uh, you know, I, one of the things I, I just want to say, I mean, we've, we've made a strong mm -hmm. step forward here uh, to increase, you know, school safety, provide for all of our campuses. And, you know, we've taken to heart the Academy of Environmental Science, the Press School, with the Virginia Technical College, we're covering those spaces. But it's still a process. It's going to be an ongoing process, right, as we look even further down the road. And you've heard some ideas mentioned here. You know, I remember back when we had a program called the Grandpa Program, getting retirees actively motivated to policing again. And we had retirees at the time who were not um, sworn, they weren't armed but they were retired law enforcement officers working in the schools and not just a mentor position, but also developing, you know, working with kids and safety, crossing guards, all kinds of stuff they were involved with. And I, I think we have heard from a lot of people in this community 
that there's a lot to offer there. And so I would <coughs> like to, to, for us to continue to look at how we can develop a program there. And maybe it's not going to be um, an armed person, but maybe we could tie in some, some other retirees uh, into helping out in a, a monitor type position. But I still think we, we continually need to keep an open mind. And Sheriff, I appreciate the fact you're going to look at you know, what happens this next year with Guardians, with the hybrid program that, that, we, that we've all talked about. Uh, because we may want to continue to expand safety even past one school resource officer, as one of our members mentioned. You know, and those are things that we still have to look at to send the message to this community that we're serious about school safety, which we have continued to be. And we are taking action. And so, um, Sheriff, thank you again for coming. And um, if there's, uh, I'm going to go back to the agenda, sir, unless you have anything else you want to say. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the only thing I'd like to say as a concluding remark is thank you all. Thank you for taking the lead and us getting this right. We, I don't know if there's anybody from the Chronicle here or not. Oh, Carly's back there in the back. But uh, I dare say, immediately in the aftermath of the Parkland shooting, we led the state because I called the superintendent and says, I'm going to put deputies out there tomorrow morning. They may not all be wearing the green uniform, but you're going to see deputies out there. And we've continuously done that since 214. And now we are taking a very strong stand here in Citrus County, again, to lead the state to the right way of doing this. And we've got a great model, and our students and our parents, as well as our faculty and staff, should be very thankful because they're immensely blessed by your leadership. So I appreciate you, and I appreciate the vigorous debate. And uh, I, I owe that lady probably a hug or two over there for all of her hard work uh, <coughs> and phone calls to say, hey, what about this idea? And um, you know, we kick them around and we get things done. But we put safety of our children very first, and that's that's very important for all of us. And there's not a person out there that can't say that we haven't done all of our homework to to make this happen and to protect our students next year. So thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Okay, item number five and board members i know we've gone a little long here but i think we're closing down on the we're almost <coughs> meeting less anyways take a break here but okay um all right mr bradshaw um did you have anything to cover on the legal matter side no sir okay all right any other business that needs to come for the board mr Mulliner. 615 golf carts will be here today. Okay. Uh, Some side graduation. <laughs> Wear your swim hats. And <laughs> we'll do the best we can to keep the, uh, keep the weather at bay. Okay. All right. Which, which time again? Just a minute. Did you say 515? 615. 615. Okay. We can get you a card at 515. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go anywhere. We'll get you. I just heard. It's ours. You had something in, in your box about the abilities are gay when reception, and it's June the 29th. They'll be judging on the 28th, and I'm going to keep the judges for the, uh, the abilities are gay. Well, very interesting because it, people who have, who are challenged and through their art they express themselves, and it's a, it's a world worldwide uh, event helping people who do have disabilities to be able to express themselves. So if you can, um, I won't be, the, be there on Friday, but I'll be there on uh, Thursday to judge. Thanks. Looking forward to hopefully staying dry for the next couple days. But we will be at graduations <laughs> and retirement <laughs> parties. You're stacked up. Mr. Um, just I want to round out our meeting remembering uh, what Ms. Powers did talked about at the beginning, and that was the gentleman who was near and dear to us, Chris Gangler. Um, I'd like to make a proposal to this board, and we've done this a few other times, but I believe this person is worthy of that. I would like to ask this board if we could, at a upcoming future date, uh, declare a proclamation 
making um, it Chris Gangler Day in our schools and in our district. This man dedicated so much. He was not simply somebody who was um, contracted or hired or worked, but he literally gave all of his talents to the kids of this community. And so um, I hope you support me in, in us doing that. <clears throat> all right. And um, we're going to have some flowers there uh, at the service, so I'll, um, I'll give, to you, uh, to give you um, you out. And we're going to uh, be represented well at the funeral, which is Saturday at 10 is the uh, visitation, and 11 o'clock is the funeral. Does one of our schools have a photography class? Yes. Citrus High School still has Citrus photography. Citrus High School is the only school that has photography. Yes, we can't do it. We can't do it. Bring yeah. yeah. in some of the back. We should, we should probably do something um, with those schools in his name for those that were not here. Yeah. 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 Yeah.